Hello, everybody, and I'd like to welcome or welcome back to my podcast. As always, if you do like this, please rate, comment, and subscribe. You can find me on iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, SoundCloud, Spotify, and YouTube. So this week, we're going to kind of break tradition on how I normally do my weekly roundups, which is I normally do them by chronological order, as in I normally start from Monday and then work my way to today. But today, we're going to have to do it a little bit backwards, because in case you have been living under a rock and are not aware of what is going on, the Mueller Russia investigation is now officially over. And to kind of take you through this particular news story chronologically, um, it dropped on 5 p.m. Friday, like literally the quintessential Friday night news dump, that Mueller has indeed finished his investigation, he finished his report, he submitted it to Attorney General Barr, and hopefully for Mueller's sake, after that he got on an airplane and flew to Fiji or Belize or Hawaii or the Maldives or some place that is warm and tropical where there is a beach where he can go lay for a couple of weeks because if there was anybody who needed a vacation right now, it is one Robert Mueller. But that dropped Friday night. And so obviously ever since 5 p.m. Eastern Standard Time on Friday, it has been an absolute fucking dumpster fire, like five alarm, all hands on deck, dumpster fire on social media, in the press, because it came out that when he submitted his report to Barr, what was originally reported, and this still stands, is that, first off, there will be no further indictments. The The, the investigation is done. Nobody else is getting charged with anything. Everybody who's been charged, that's it. Like, that's it. We're done. No more charges, no more indictments. Which means that nobody got indicted for anything related to collusion or at least anybody U.S.-based, and obviously nobody in the Trump camp or Trump himself got indicted for collusion, which was the whole point of the Mueller investigation, but we will cycle back to that. The other thing that I found interesting, and now other people are finally starting to find interesting, is that nobody was indicted on any kind of obstruction of justice charges based around the, the Cohen congressional testimony. As some of you may remember, because I've talked about it, a certain news outlet ran a story saying that Mueller had evidence that Trump actually instructed Michael Cohen to lie to Congress. Where you at, BuzzFeed? You told me that this story was going to somehow age itself into being correct. Where you at? You retracting that story yet? No? Okay. That's all right. I see you. But so all of that dropped. And so obviously everybody lost their shit. Like it was, I I cannot begin to describe to you guys, if you were not following this on social media or you have been avoiding cable news, oh my God, it has been pure insanity of watching these people try to spin this. It's just been, it's been completely nuts. So like I said, that started at 5 o'clock on Friday afternoon. It is now, what time is it? About 4.30 here, Eastern Standard Time, Sunday. And yeah, this story has pretty much swept everything else off of the game board. Like, nobody's talking about anything else anymore. So, here are my thoughts on this. And there has been very, 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 very recent revelations, as in, like, right before I started recording, and I was actually waiting to record because the the bar letter pertaining to the Mueller investigation, the Mueller report, which I, I want to make clear for everybody who may not entirely understand what's going on right now, the Mueller report in and of itself has not been released to the public. It has not been made clear if it will or will not be. Personally, I'm team release it because, hell, we paid for it. We've been hearing about it for the past two fucking years. I'd like to see it. But as it stands right now, we do not have that. What we do have is a letter that Attorney General Barr wrote, basically summarizing his views on the Mueller report. And 
We'll get there in a second because, I, like I said, I want to take this still in a bit of a chronological order. And there are some people that really, really need to get called out on this. And the first group of people is the media. You dishonest hacks. Are you kidding me right now? I have seen the most insane spin I think I've ever seen in my entire life since the Mueller report dropped and the the fact that we now know that the investigation's over and nobody else is being indicted. Trump is not being indicted for collusion. Neither is anybody else. Nobody's getting charged with obstruction of justice. So now all of a sudden, all of the fucking sudden, the line is now, oh, it was never that big a deal to begin with, which... Are you, excuse me? Excuse me. You people hyped this for two fucking years. Two years this investigation has been going on. And I have lost track of how many times the media has promoted this story or that story or whatever story as the big one. This is the one that's going to take out Trump. It, it, and, and it's going to be Russiagate. And just, just you wait until that Mueller report drops. Then you're going to have proof that you colluded with Russia. And, and yeah. And now all of a sudden you want to play like you weren't invested in this. Really? You want to play like you didn't push this narrative. You want to play like this was not an entirely media-driven creation that you didn't spend the past two years obsessing about this and coming up with story after story after story that ended up being bold-faced lies, and now you want to play like you didn't care. Okay. Right. No. Y'all went all in on this shit. The media went all in on this, and now you've got nothing. What they were waiting for was for this to actually vindicate the past two years of covering this stupid stuff stupid story, which it has been stupid from day one. It was stupid when it started the day after Donald Trump got elected, when all of a sudden it became Russia collusion, not Hillary lost because she was an awful candidate who ran a shit campaign. It was collusion, 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 collusion. That's all anybody wanted to talk about. And now, now what? Now you just realize you spent I mean, if you want to go back, because it literally started the day after Donald Trump got elected. If you want to go back about two and a half years now, and say that that you weren't pushing this, that this was not a media creation, that this wasn't some shit that you wanted to push to try to justify why Hillary lost. That's what this was. That's where it started at. And now, now you have to come to grips with the fact that no, Trump was not colluding with Russia. That's not to say that Russia wasn't trying to meddle in our, our elections. That's already been proven. Big fucking shocker. I'm sure they try to meddle in everybody's elections. We try to meddle in everybody's elections. Every country tries to meddle in every other country's elections. That ain't news. What the whole point of this was, was to show that Trump had something to do with it. That it was being done at his behest. And now you don't have that. So now what? And you don't get to spin your way out of this. Uh-uh. No. Mm-mm. This... And, and I know, I say all this, I know nobody's going to be held accountable for it. I know that. But I think it is somewhat incumbent upon us to remind these people on a regular basis that you spent two years pushing a lie. And you pushed it because you didn't want to deal with the truth. And it was just easier and better for you to try to think that Trump colluded with the Russians instead of just owning up to the facts that Hillary lost. That's it. She fucking lost of her own accord. Nobody else had to help her. And the other line that everybody wants to push right now to try to excuse themselves for going balls deep on this dumbass story is that, oh, look, oh, look at all these other people that got indicted and charged on this, that, and whatever. So the point of the Mueller investigation was to determine whether Trump colluded with Russia to influence the 2016 election. It was not to determine that Trump surrounded himself with scumbags. We certainly did not need a two-year investigation to figure that out. Everybody knew that off the rip. So no, don't try to move the goalpost and try to act like there was some kind of fearic victory here. No, there wasn't. You got handed an L that is so large, I don't even know if there is a truck big enough to carry it. No, you don't get to spin this away. You lost. You gambled and you lost. And now, now what? 
two years, two fucking years, you spent praying for this report, and now it's here, and you didn't get what you want. Boo hoo. Now you have to deal with reality. I, I hope the media enjoyed their two and a half year break from the reality of 2016. But guess what? It's here now, motherfuckers. Now you got to deal with it. And it's just like, I can't. I cannot. And there's just, it's it's been said, and I don't know if I entirely agree with this, but people are floating the idea that the Russia Gate and the media's complicity in pushing it and just advancing the topic is along the lines of what they did after 9-11 as far as getting us into Iraq. Now, I can kind of understand the parallels because a lot of what got us into Iraq was the media cheerleading Bush and this idea that Iraq has WMDs and so we have to go there. Okay, this Russiagate is bad. Russiagate didn't get anybody killed. So I don't know as if I'm thoroughly okay with linking those two together, but as far as making the point of the media going all in to promote something that ultimately turned out to be a lie, okay, I can kind of understand that point. Don't know if it's the one I want to make myself, but I get you. I, I feel where you're coming from. And so... To kind of bring it to today, right before I started recording, um, the the letter that Barr wrote with his thoughts on the Mueller report dropped, and like I said, I was waiting for it because I wanted to go ahead and include it because it was, originally, it was supposed to be this weekend, and then it was supposed to be sometime yesterday, and now here it is today on a Sunday afternoon, which should pretty much tell you everything you need to know, because obviously you don't drop shit on a Sunday afternoon if it's really, like, super great and positive. So, here's the thing. He said in his letter that, I mean, bar none, there was no evidence of collusion between Trump and Russia for the 2016 campaign. Like, that's completely done, off the table, no evidence whatsoever. However, he did address the obstruction of justice charge, and this is the one that I personally have been way more interested in versus the whole Russia thing, because as far as I'm concerned, the Russia stuff, I mean, that's not an impeachable offense. I mean, that's something that you could certainly prosecute Trump for after he leaves office, but once, since right now, like the, the things that would be impactful today, the obstruction of justice charge to me was way, 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 way bigger. Because, like I've explained before, in order to charge a sitting president with a crime, it's a crime that would have had to have been committed while he was in office. Which, the Cohen testimony, if it had turned out to be true that he did, in fact, instruct Cohen to lie to Congress, that is obstruction of justice. That would have been committed while he was in office. And that would be, I mean, immediate impeachment proceedings. Like, just immediately. Like, there, there would be no question. So, here's here's how Barr parsed it, and I will try to explain because obviously this is something that just dropped, and so thoughts are evolving on the social medias right now as I'm recording, but here's how he laid it out. Basically, he said that in Mueller's report, he investigated the obstruction of justice charges and did not really opine one way or the other. Like, he presented the evidence for it. He presented the evidence against it, but Mueller himself did not give any instructions as to whether or not he felt that Trump should be charged with obstruction of justice. Basically, he was kicking it to Barr and the Department of Justice to make that decision. So after Barr reviewed it, he looked at the evidence that Mueller presented in the report and decided that there was not enough evidence there to charge Trump with obstruction of justice. So People are interpreting this in very different ways right now. Personally, I, I look at this as a very black and white issue. It's like either you are charging someone with a crime or you're not. If you don't have enough evidence to charge somebody with a crime, then you then it's not there. You that's it. As far as I'm concerned, like that's then I, there's there's that's the end of the discussion for me. Some people are viewing this as Barr kicking this out to Congress now to for them to make a decision as to whether or not 
they wish to pursue that through impeachment hearings. Here's my thing. And I know this will break a lot of people's hearts, probably not anybody who's listening to this, but if you were of the opinion that this was going to create some kind of slam dunk, impeachable thing where proceedings could start tomorrow, Congress could have started impeachment proceedings whenever they wanted. Like Congress really doesn't, well, I should back that up. I shouldn't say Congress. The House can start impeachment proceedings whenever they want for basically whatever reason they want. Like it's, it behooves you to have a very good reason because obviously if you are moving to impeach a sitting president and overturn the will of the American people, you should probably have a very good fucking reason for doing so. But that being said, they could have done it at any time. My thought is what they were waiting for is for Mueller to release this report and to hand out indictments either to Trump himself or to members of his immediate family or his inner circle as far as either on collusion or obstruction of justice. They did not get that, obviously. So, it's not to say that the House won't start impeachment proceedings or that they can't. I'm saying that they're not going to. Because like I said, they could have done it at any time before now. They could have done it on any of the publicly available information had they chose to do so. They were specifically waiting for this report to give them cover to do it. And this report, in my eyes, does not do that. Because the obvious defense, if the House wanted to start impeachment proceedings against Trump, all he has to say is, I was found innocent of collusion, which he it, it exonerates him on the collusion charges, and there was not enough evidence to charge me with obstruction of justice. And what is your comeback to that? Like, there's there's no viable comeback to those facts. So what the house does from here, who knows? I, who, who the fuck knows what those people are going to do on anything, honestly, but that's my view of where, where this goes from here. But the one thing that we do know is that the Russia investigation, Mueller's investigation is finally over and there are no indictments being handed down based on collusion, conspiracy, obstruction of justice, anything like that from Mueller's office. And those are irrefutable facts. Whatever you want to feel about the rest of it, you can feel however you want to feel. If the Mueller report does finally become public in a somewhat unredacted form where it will actually be readable by the American public, if you want to form opinions on what's in the report, cool. Do you. But these are the facts as it stands right now is there was not enough there there to charge anybody with anything. Now, the other thing that people are kind of pivoting to and keeping their eye on right now is the Southern District of New York, who is also running their own concurrent investigation into various Trump things. And as far as I'm concerned, like before the bar letter dropped, that's where everybody was at was like, oh, let's wait for the SDNY. I'm like, what do you think they're going to have that Mueller didn't have? Do you think they're going to have some magic information that he didn't have access to? Like, are you kidding me? Like, and and the thing is that now that this report has dropped and Barr's letter has dropped, I think that is going to severely influence how SDNY proceeds forward from here. And again, that's not to say that they won't bring their own charges. They can bring their own charges, but it's going to look a little odd. And I think it's going to be a little difficult to defend bringing any kind of charges that the DOJ just declined to bring against Trump. You know what I'm saying? Like it's going to be, that would be a very hard road to hoe because again, you have this piece of information here where the DOJ declined to charge me with anything. So exactly what is the basis of SDNY charging me for doing anything? You see, like you you see where this all kind of falls in line and all falls together. So I don't see anything coming of this. Like obviously Trump has not been charged with anything through the DOJ. Whatever SDNY does is their business. I don't see them doing anything either. And with those two pieces missing, Impeachment is going to be a very, very hard sell, not only to 
Congress, but to the American people. Like, and, and I don't know if there is enough Trump hatred in House Democrats for them to stick their necks out on the line to risk it. I don't think there is. I don't know. It's evolving. We'll see what happens over the next week, but I don't know. But I'm just, I'm happy it's over. I'm just happy this investigation is finally fucking over, like two plus years. And that's another thing that I want to talk about before I leave off of this topic. And I know I've talked a lot about this, but I mean, this is, this is what anybody, this is all anybody's talking about right now. And that is just talking about the fact that this has been an almost two year long investigation that started with trying to determine whether Trump colluded with Russia in the 2016 campaign. Two years, people. There comes a time where you have to end an investigation. You can't just keep investigating somebody for forever and ever and ever just because you don't like them. So the fact that this even went on as long as it did, I think is a little problematic because that's not how our justice system should work. I mean, you should be, if you're being charged with something, if somebody is asking another entity to investigate you for something, you do it, you either make the charge, you don't make the charge, you keep it moving. You don't spend years on end going on a fishing expedition trying to dig up dirt on somebody to charge them with something. Like, that's really not okay. No matter how you may happen to feel about Trump, the fact that that happened to anybody isn't okay. And that's ultimately what this ended up turning out being after a while was a fishing expedition. And so, sure, you got all these other players, you got you got Manafort, you got Cohen, you got Flynn, you got all these other people, you got Roger Stone, you didn't get Trump. So, yeah. Anyway, I think I have said pretty much everything there is to say on this particular topic right now. I'm sure we will discuss it again next week because, again, like I said, good God, next week is going to be fucking insane, but... Anyway, moving on, because there are a couple of other topics I wanted to talk about before leaving off of this episode. Like, I didn't want to make this just a completely Mueller weekend dumpster fire episode. There are other things to talk about. So let's go ahead and pivot to where I would have naturally started this episode had the past 48 hours not happened. And that is to our our favorite punching bag of the moment, one Robert Francis O'Rourke or Beto. I'm going to, I'm going to learn how to say it right, people. I'm going to try. It's very hard for my mouth to make that E sound. But anyway, Beto. Last episode, last weekly roundup I did, I talked about how he had launched his campaign. And as of that recording, he had not released his numbers as far as his first day fundraising. And I, along with a lot of other people, interpreted that as that they were less than stellar. I was wrong. In fact, he actually pulled on his first 24 hours of of fundraising $6.1 million, which means he has now beat out Bernie for the biggest one day total so far in the Democratic primary. Here is what's interesting about that is, first of all, this this really sums up, I mean, and, and you can also say this about Bernie's numbers too. This really sums up how difficult it is going to be to really judge the landscape for 2020 as far as the Democratic voter base. Because much like Bernie, Beto is not loved by the online left. In fact, I I don't think, I don't know who loves Beto, but obviously somebody does because he just pulled in over $6 billion in 24 hours. So... This is going to be something that's very hard to understand because right now, for me, these two facts don't square. Like, I see no online support from the left for Beto, but he did monster numbers. So, who donated? And this is why I say this is going to be so hard to try to parse out and understand because when you look at things online. Like people say Twitter isn't real life. In a lot of ways, it actually is. But this is one where it's going to be, 
it, it's going to be weird because if you look at the reactions to Beto online, you would think that he's not pulling any kind of numbers. But he is. And the same with Bernie. And so there is apparently, I'm, I'm assuming, I don't know. And for what it's worth, when Beto announced his numbers, he did say that they were all obviously individual donors and averaged out the average donation was like $47. So this was a bunch of small donations. So there's apparently a silent portion of the Dem base out there, or at least a somewhat more subdued version of the base out there that is not like the online left. It's just, it's, it, this is a very difficult one for me because it, 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 this makes it very hard to try to get a good bead and a good pulse on what exactly is going on with the Dem voter base. And the fact that every candidate save for Beto, who actually is running as something of a centrist, or at least as centrist as one can possibly be right now, every other candidate has gone hard, hard left to try to appeal to that online left base. But apparently there is a huge swath of Democratic voters who aren't being served by those candidates and aren't part of that particular movement. Where they're at, I don't know, because how are you going to find them? Because they're silent. It, it's, it's, it's something that I think somebody with more time and more resources than me should probably look into. Because I had thought, and this was, this was my thing, and this is also probably part of being extremely online. I thought that this debate was kind of settled already, especially since so many candidates were going so far left to appeal to a certain demographic that that was where the Dem base is all together. Apparently it's not. And maybe, maybe it's that, maybe it's that Bernie and Beto just have name recognition. Maybe people are just still hopped up on Beto because he just ran against Ted Cruz. I don't know. But apparently there is more of a split there than I had thought that there was. And apparently more of a split than any other candidate thought there was because nobody else is doing the numbers that those two are doing. And I, I want to say Bernie's was just shy of six million. It was either just shy or at six million. So obviously this $12 million between Bernie's millions and Beto's millions came from somewhere and nobody else, like it's not even fucking close to anybody else touching those numbers. Like for example, Kamala Harris, who seems to be something of a darling for the online left. I, I don't get it. I do not fucking get it. But I think her first day was 1.5 million, just to put it in perspective, like, that is a massive, massive gap in fundraising. And so maybe, like I said, maybe a, a discussion that I thought was settled isn't quite as settled as I thought it was. And this should make for some rather interesting infighting. It, it will be very interesting to watch which faction ends up winning this particular battle. But... I did want to go ahead and touch on that because I did talk about it last week and I wanted to do a bit of an addendum to say that I was wrong and that he did pull monster numbers and now I'm very, very confused about what the hell is going on in the Democratic Party and who is going to end up with this nomination. I don't know. I, I don't think any of them could beat Trump except for Bernie, but whether Bernie gets a nomination, I don't know. It's, it's very weird. It's It's all... It's all very weird to me right now. So anyway, moving on from that to the last topic that I wanted to talk about before we, we leave out. And that's because I had been talking about it and asking about it. And it is now finally here. Trump's campus free speech executive order does now officially exist and has been signed. And yeah, if we're being honest, it's pretty slim pickings, honestly. For, for as much as it was hyped up 
And as much as it was meant to be this big to-do, and Charlie Kirk was at the signing, and there was a couple of other people at the signing. Um, that guy that just got punched in the face for advertising TPUSA at Berkeley, I think it was, and a couple of other people like that. But anyway, I want to go ahead and read the relevant text from the EO, and that is that, It is the policy of the federal government to encourage institutions to foster environments that promote open, intellectually engaging, and diverse debate, including thought thorough compliance with the First Amendment for public institutions and compliance with stated institutional policies regarding freedom of speech for private institutions, the order states. To advance this policy, the heads of the covered agencies shall, in coordination with the Director of the Office of Management and Budget, and budget sorry, take appropriate steps in a manner consistent with applicable law, including the First Amendment, to ensure institutions that receive federal research or education grants promote free inquiry, including thorough compliance with all applicable federal laws, regulations, and policies. Now, as many people have already pointed out, and I'll go ahead and point out too, public universities who receive money are already subject to First Amendment, so that's nothing new. And the thing about this EO, and I have heard that there is going to be further details coming later on this, but there's nothing in here that says anything about how exactly and who exactly will be enforcing these rules or what the rules will look like or anything like that. So right now, the EO by itself is kind of nothing. It's, it's fluff without any kind of like enforcement arm or any kind of idea of what exactly this is supposed to be covering. It's there. It's decorative. He, he signed a piece of paper. Charlie Kirk was there and there was a photo op. But as far as this actually doing anything, like at this point, I'm, I'm waiting to see how exactly this will be implemented and who will be implementing it and what the rules of implementation will be. I mean, there's there's nothing here. Like, there's really nothing to talk about. It kind of, it kind of sucks. I was I was really kind of hoping to be able to finally have a discussion about this, but again, I'm still having to wait for more information to come to tell me exactly what the hell this is supposed to accomplish. Because right now, it's nothing. It's fucking nothing. This accomplishes nothing aside from a photo op for Charlie Kirk, which. Anyway, but I think that pretty much covers everything that I wanted to talk about in this week's weekly roundup. So I am going to go ahead and wrap this up. If you did make it this far, thank you as always. And if you did like this, please rate, comment, and subscribe. You can find me on iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, SoundCloud, Spotify, and YouTube. Take care and until next time.